Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Randy Rainwater. Randy, welcome to the podcast. Nice to be here. Yeah, you've been on my list for a long time. We've been talking about doing this and getting you on and kind of met at, uh, I think, one or two of the drum shows, probably Chicago, and uh, we we finally made it happen. So... (laughs) Yeah, this has been a while in the making here. I know. And I appreciate your wife, Nancy, helping you to get it uh, set up. That's always nice to <laughs> have some help. Yeah. So, Randy, um, like I said, you're kind of a staple at the drum shows. You've got quite the collection yourself, which we'll hear about. Um, and uh, But today we're specifically talking about like rare and unique drum finishes, which there really is... Um, some some very unique finishes that we all kind of know about, but I think you know a lot more about them um, with some of the big brands. Uh, so why don't we jump in here a little bit? And I think a good starting point is maybe explain what got you into really studying these these great finishes and acquiring them and and, and learning about them. And then we'll we'll talk about each individual one. But um, what drew you to you know rare and unique drum finishes? Well, as far as collecting rare finishes, it was, you know, I collected everything. Uh, a lot of collectors start out buying everything they can get their hands on. And occasionally you come across a gem here and there. I don't, I can't afford to chase down, you know, super rare finishes and stuff. And it's just uh, the stuff that I do have that's rare. Uh, it's kind of dumb luck. Sure. That's how it started. And uh, um, mainly a Ludwig guy, but I've come across some other stuff that was, you know, that I really like. And, and I, I used to have everything and uh, I'm kind of trying to thin the herd a little bit. But, you know, I don't have, you know, the pocketbook to afford shopping for Peacock Pearl and all that yeah. kind of stuff. I'm, I'm glad you said that, though, because sometimes like I, I've said it in a few episodes before, but like you hear about some collectors where they obviously have. I mean, everyone usually has a different job, but some of these collections are so huge where it's like, is it just me who can't afford to buy every single thing they come across? <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it's, you know, it's some expensive. of the big shot collectors, you know, like Bunny and Mike Curato and these guys and money doesn't seem to be as big of a issue, you know, uh, when you're hunting super rare finishes, you know, I've, I've only lucked into a few really rare ones. Yeah. You know, I've got a lot of 60s stuff. You have the mod finishes in the 60s stuff where, you know, they kind of came to the surface like 15, 20 years ago, again, after being, you know, a little more obscure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the beauty of all this, of all this stuff to do with drums is you don't have to own stuff to be knowledgeable about it and to study it and to love it because like there's things like drum archive uh, dot com and there's there's all these you can look at old um, articles and and things like that just to enjoy it so um, on that note which is kind of what we'll do today is is talk about them so people can can learn about them and just look at pictures maybe Google it and all that stuff um, so Randy let's hop in and I I think it's good to maybe start way back and go you know talk about some of the older finishes like I know there's the like autograph of the stars finish and stuff like that and the the top hat and cane which is uh kind of one of the famous super sought after ones so let's jump in here history wise and what are some 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 really old finishes that you think are are very rare and again these aren't things you have to have physically owned yourself but just so folks can look them up and enjoy it and, uh, and, and kind of follow along with us. Um, where do you think it begins with the, the rare, uh, finishes in history? Oh, uh, you know, like mostly the 20 stuff, the, you know, the peacock, like I mentioned before, uh, terracotta. Sure. And, uh, you know, of, of course, uh, butterscotch, uh, Bob Campbell just did an article on butterscotch pearl. That's what it's been named. I don't know mm. if it was, the official name of it. It was an uncatalogued finish. You know, there's a turquoise pearl, you know, kind of a streaked pearl. So let me ask you this though. So that's an interesting point you said about uncategorized finishes. Cause like, I don't know if you know this information, but like, how does that work where like they're releasing finishes? Was it just like, you know, it was way before the internet, obviously it was, it was pretty early on. Would they just make finishes and just not categorize it and, or, or put it in a catalog and just, 
send them out or what was the kind of thought process behind that? And this is, this is strictly my, my personal theory as it's like, I don't like when people get, you know, their, their theories mixed up with facts. So I want to make it real clear that I can only assume that they did like they do now is a a small test run of some finish that, um, you know, seeing how it, how it looks, how, how it flies, how it's received. And so some stuff pops up, you know, and, um, you know, it's like finding a Ludwig kit in anniversary sparkle that, you know, is traditionally a Gretsch finish. Um, but they exist, you know, and, uh, years back, Joe Loma came up with that Gretsch kit that they reproduced, uh, with the kind of the, the sunburst or brown burst finish on it, which they started reproducing a few years back. Um, mm. you know, and then, uh, some guys came up with another Gretsch kit that had like weird finish on it that nobody's ever seen. So you can, I can only assume that these were, you know, tests or special orders or, uh, you prototype know, or something. Yeah. Like a prototype, I guess would be the perfect way to describe them. Um, yeah. um you know, yeah, still Ludwig comes up with stuff now that shows up at the drum show. You know, we did 10 of these and, you know, and stuff like that. Yeah. Or, it's interesting because it really means that like you got to have a keen eye to maybe see this particular sparkle finish is like, oh, that's super rare where someone might just walk by it. If it's if it's like a particular if it's not something that stands out like a top hat and cane or whatever, yeah. uh, you just got to kind of know what you're looking for. Um, so with the big brands and this is getting pretty specific, but like, are you aware of like, were they making these these wraps and these finishes in house or were these being kind of um, acquired by, you know, a manufacturer like uh, that they could all buy from? Or, or how did that do you know how that would work? I, I don't. But I would only assume that they would. There was somebody that was manufacturing per their specs and mm-hmm. stuff. I, I can't imagine they did all that in house. No. You know. Do they in your in your experience collecting and finding them, you know, at drum shows, do they hold up pretty well? Does the glue stick after all that time or is there some some repair that's needed? It it's funny how how you know, I, I think it goes for a lot of products. It's like sometimes it seems like the newer they are at times, the less they hold up. Uh, I remember like p- finishes from like 20 years ago were all cracking and shattering on the drums where you can find a like a 60s Ludwig kit in a barn and and wipe the dust off and it still looks great most of the time unless it's really beat but you you know it seemed like some of the stuff when they tried to make it cheaper it was just that cheaper yeah in in quality you know yeah Uh, shrinkage and shattering and you know stuff like that yeah so, all right. So if we're talking in the twenties now, which, which, I mean, that's a hundred years ago. Yeah. <laughs> like it's pretty crazy to think that, I mean, and they, they were really, really cool finishes. So this would be uh brands, like maybe name some of the brands. So folks can like look them up. It would obviously be Ludwig at that point, uh, Leedy, right. Who else would yeah. be in the, in the manufacturing, you know, world at that point? Well, Gretsch, Gretsch, uh, Slingerland, Ludwig, uh, Leedy, of course. It's 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 funny to see some of the, you know, like the the '60s finish, like the German ones from Sonars and and uh, Trixons, always had pretty cool finishes. Yeah, and uh, and of course, you know, when the Japanese started getting into the 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 drum world, then then that was the possibilities were endless with all yeah. the different. And kind of the ripoff finishes, some of them were, you know, but yeah, which they're, they're awesome though. Those they are some are of my awesome. favorites. Yeah. They're really cool, which, they, uh, uh, you know, and maybe this is something too, we can talk about as we go is the, what was popular as at each decade, because like, uh, you know, sparkle becomes popular and then the, the oyster pearls, obviously after Ringo became very popular and I'm sure before that, but it seemed like from what I can tell, uh, in the twenties, it looks like a lot of that, like, um, that kind of swirl and what, what is the, what would the term for that be? Uh, 
that you it's, you said it's almost like a peacock finish, but it seemed like there was that kind of marbly look to a lot of them. In oh, the, uh, the one I was trying to think of before was like an abalone finish. That's what I was. Yeah. There's a couple different versions of that, um, but uh, it's just it's it's one of the most beautiful finishes. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I don't know how they, you know, it makes you wonder how they came up with this stuff. You yeah. know, if they if the stuff was. You know, they always, you know, like mother of toilet seat, they would call it, where they use this white marine pearl on hairbrushes and dressing table sets. And yeah. um, you've seen different things that were so, somewhat laminated with this plastic. So if that's, you know, there was some manufacturer making this. And yeah, I can only assume that the drum manufacturers kind of somebody had that idea to put it on a drum set. Yeah. Like, the original design because they're not using photoshop the original design of that finish and i i remember it uh seeing some video once of like you know old books have that kind of swirly multicolored, like like almost like a dark like a purple and a dark yellow like this pattern and i remember seeing them make that where it was like liquids paint i guess put in this thing and then it had like uh like needles that would go through and pull through the liquid to give it that kind of swirly finish uh, raking i think raking. they call it a, like a rake finish yeah where yeah i think that's how the oysters and stuff were done if i if i'm right on that yeah um they never seem to be able to get it right when they reproduce they're getting close but it's uh they can never quite get it nailed down to be as good as the old stuff you know that's but, what i hear <laughs> yeah as, i mean don't get me wrong i like the new ones um because i'm i'm all about the panache when it comes to a drum set you know yeah, yeah. But, um yeah they just they can't quite seem to reproduce the old finishes to a t yeah. yeah nothing's nothing's like the same as it it, it as it used to be but um it's probably right. an EPA thing, you know. Yeah, it was probably made of like <laughs> yeah. lead and asbestos and all this stuff. Yeah, could... it's probably formaldehyde yeah. and asbestos. Yeah, yeah. All right, so that's the twenties, which we can kind of picture, and, and I'm sure p- people can Google it. But like, like trap drum sets. I mean, really, it's kind of the new world of like you know big bass drum and a little trap table with your beautiful bass drum that's got the finish on it. Like maybe like a Chinese tom tom, which would be a different color. Uh, not really the traditional, you know, four piece or five piece jazz drum set. So let's move forward then. So if that was the twenties, then we get into like the thirties as we move forward, what was get, getting different? Well, the, the evolution of the drum set went from s- snare to snare and bass to snare and bass and contraptions, you know, mm-hmm. a trap set and, uh, cymbals, Chinese toms, uh, weird little, clangy things and you know sound effect stuff and um then they started making tom toms to add to a drum set with you know some of them were tacked i i had some that were tacked top and bottom heads and um but then the tack bottom heads and then i think i read somewhere that gene krupa had the idea to make double tuning drums I heard that too. I think Brooks said that, so I trust Brooks on. Yeah, uh, he's if it's Slingerland, <laughs> he's usually up on it. And, yeah, uh, and um, and then you know the rest is history. You know, drum sets as we know them. Everybody seems keeps trying to reinvent the wheel, but it kind of keeps going back to you know a regular drum set again. Yeah, it's like everything progressed to a point, and then it was like this is good. Like, this is a good drum set. Let's, you know, we can we can keep it there. And I guess, you know, it's it's almost just like uh, you take for granted now that it was like, you know, the the tom matches the floor tom matches the bass drum. But like we were saying before, the Chinese tom tom would have been like red and then there maybe would be no floor tom. But then you add the tom in and it's just more room to spread that finish out and and have that. I mean, drums are beautiful. And it's neat, too, when like, you know, companies like Slingerland will be making banjos. And and that was, as Mark Cooper said, the most popular instrument in the world. And I like to see when people have the matching banjo and drum set, in his case, in that green. That uh, Oh, yeah. That's, you know, the <laughs> green and the, the rose pearl banjos. Yeah. Are, you know, it's just like, I said, everybody hopes to find one of those, even if you don't play banjo. You oh, know? yeah. <laughs> you just have it. But yeah, so... um 
Now, are there any finishes that come to mind in, I mean, this is super specific, but like the thirties or forties that we're starting to see, like in your knowledge, when does like white Marine Pearl become sort of the iconic, like jazzer drum finish? Well, I, I think it's, um, it was probably the most accessible. It was probably the, the easiest to get. And it was probably, again, I can only assume it was probably the first step up away from painted finishes, yeah. you know, cause it was the most accessible. And then, you know, of course they start adding colors and then they, uh, you see a few of these pearl sets, WFL, where it's like a fade where it's blue, white, blue, like a, paint underneath the pearloid mm -hmm. um i've seen um one's like a black diamond with a red stripe through it and stuff mm -hmm. like that you know and, but uh, you know just like the 60s i just wonder how popular something that was you know too wild for the time you know it's it too too against the grain you know because you don't see you don't see as many of those as you do with the white green pearl or the black diamond yeah and and, uh, yeah, I mean, that's like, you know, they make a bunch of cars in silver and blue and black, but they don't make cars in like uh, millions of cars in like neon green. But you hey, can I was get just going to say that. Yeah, you don't <laughs> see a lot of lime green cars, you know, but, but you do you, see you do yeah. see them, though. They're out there. Yeah, yeah. Can you explain? You just said perloid when people like maybe we also just hit on some of the like terminology so people know what does that refer to? as as the perloid is that like uh like obviously we're talking about pearl but like yeah is that like because you said adding that over the paint well you know i peeled a drum set one time and, um you know i just anticipate if anybody listens to this you know busting my chops at the show you know <laughs> you know you don't know what you're talking about i peeled a gretsch drum set one time and the pearl came off but the color stayed on the shell so the pearl was like, like a translucent, like that contact paper you stick on a bathroom window with the color underneath it. So it's funny that you don't see more crazy finishes with that technique. You know, I can only assume that's how the, some of those early WFL kits were done with the, the multicolored pearl was with a, a paint underneath the, the, uh, the pearloid over the top of it yeah kind of so, like a a clear coat basically yeah it's like a clear plastic that looks like pearl but with no color yeah it's interesting i remember uh i gotta listen back to it but steel turkington from uh kentville drumheads and and repairs did did an episode and he really broke down about it's a layer of this and then it's a layer of clear and then it's a layer of sparkle and it was i mean it's a science uh um, oh yeah 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 I did some R and D for a plastic company, uh, the guy and his son, his son was a drummer and we met up and started doing some stuff. Well, they, I, they were trying to reinvent the wheel and, uh, I gave him some samples of different drum wraps and, and he had some, they were, I think they were trying to do it more economical, but they, they had some, somebody that was fresh out of college told them they couldn't make drums wrap out of some material. And I go, well, what's it made out of? And he goes, just that. And I go, well, how do they argue that it can't be made out of that? If it, that's what it is made out of. Hmm. Of course, you know, now it's PV, a lot of it's PVC hmm. and you get some that's a little more rubbery than others. You know, I've, I've got some stuff. I think it's some import stuff. It's, um, it has a different feel to it. I wrap a lot of kits for people and, and hmm. myself, you know, well, I later I want to talk about that because that's okay. that's not it's not an easy process. It's not cheap to to buy all the wrap. No, um, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm always I've wanted to do it for so long, but I'm always I'm like, you know, I'm going to do it. And then I look and I add it up and I'm like, oh, it's like $600 to buy all the stuff and then it's like, okay, I'm going to screw this up. But I want to get your tips later. But um so before we move on, I got to ask you though, you were talking about uh painted drum shells as as the the you know uh as the finish which makes perfect sense because of course you know people would paint things uh and i'm sure it was probably lead-based paint but way back in the day which uh nowadays mm. is not <laughs> you don't want um 
would would the downside of painting the drum shells be that it flakes off and it it or what's that whole process like well that's i think that's the 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 curse of the the painted drum set is they don't seem to be primed very very uh, often you know like bass drum hoops where the black just falls off the the maple and the the painted drums are usually maple underneath the paint to where it was a nice smooth finish to paint on and of course with no bonding agent and any kind of primer or anything like that it you know expands and contracts with temperature probably different than the wood yeah you can only you know i can is how i always figure it but it just ends up getting all checked and yeah so as i mentioned before i just want to get your because there's some that are like the uh the coca-cola of like rare drum head drum finishes where people know them where it would be the top hat and cane which would be ludwig correct right uh and then there's the autograph of the stars if i'm not mistaken the, these are just the ones where if you google rare finishes they usually show up that was leady wasn't it yeah okay what's your thoughts on these are they like i mean i imagine they're they, they're astronomically expensive because maybe they're kind of in our world, household names where people know know those. What do you think about those super rare ones that are buzzworthy? Well, one, one turned up a few years ago, which was a white marine pearl kit that was an autograph of the stars kit instead of that blue. Yeah, the blue. Yeah, well, there was uh, Steve Maxwell had the one that was just like, you know, the, the freak drum set that was... Uh, I don't know who ended up with that. Mike Luskovich or somebody ended up with it. Mm. And, uh, but it was like, never seen another one, you know? Wow. Prototype. Like you were saying, where it was probably, Hey, let's try it in white. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. You know, wow. and tend to one, the bean counter at the factory was like, it's not cost effective to <laughs> do specialty. You know, they're really cool though. I think that one is neat. And I can't remember. I remember I looked at it a long time ago. I think I did. Uh, there's a leady episode with Rob cook, which is episode like five or something. Um, who were the autographs? Were they just celebrities of the day or were they like fake? I names? thought that I, you know, I don't really know. Uh, I thought they were like leady endorsers. Oh, cool. Stuff, like, like famous drummers, uh, leady players. Yeah. If I had heard correctly. Yeah. That's cool. So we talked about painted finishes. Uh, and then now I guess moving forward, we kind of get into, obviously there's the, there's the, the rap and all that stuff as we, as we go on. So that was kind of 30s ish uh, moving 30s into 40s. There's the famous, you know, the wartime drums, as Joey Boom has covered on the show uh, a few times. What about that? What's what's your thoughts in, in this era uh, of collecting in that that late 30s, early to mid 40s? Uh, what do you find there? It's funny. Everything, uh, everything World War Two I had, I, I sold to Joe. Yeah uh because it's his thing <laughs> you know and yeah. uh but yeah you know that was it was kind of cool they still used perloid on some of the rolling bomber kits I mean, a lot of them were you know the, the rosewood lugs and the you know painted finishes but it was nice to see nothing prettier than a white marine pearl kit with rosewood lugs on it yeah and like i say i don't another one i don't come across very often yeah know, like, i don't pursue as much as i you know, I used to be, I, the, the only thing I was ahead of the curve on a lot of these young guys where I was out pulling stuff out of the newspaper every day. If you remember what a newspaper used to be, it was a <laughs> um, <laughs> newspaper. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, so I was up early in the morning. I'd get the paper and I'd start calling people. They had grandpa's drum set in the attic and wanted to get rid of it. And. So that's, you know, how you find a bunch of this crazy old stuff. And yeah. of course now, you know, picking of anything is, is getting harder and harder because of all these TV shows and, and stuff like yeah, that. Very true. I don't know, but they're there. You're right. Where, I mean, it seems to me like rolling bombers and the other ones, you see a lot of white Marine Pearl. Um, but I guess that's interesting because that, that finish and that Pearloid, what maybe wasn't so needed in the war effort uh, where they could still use it. Cause I guess it's just a chemical mixture where it's more uh, attainable versus the metal, which would be like, yeah. You know, the, yeah. The metal is the thing that changed the whole 
design of the wartime drums. It could yeah. only be like 10% metal, you know, as minimal as possible. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, now that's all kind of the early stuff. When, when we get forward into like the fifties and sixties, I think that's more kind of modern drum set where you're still, people take them out to gigs on a weekly basis now, which they do sure. for with, you don't really have like a thirties drum set at a bar, you know, playing covers. You can, I'm sure people do. <laughs> I do. You do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, uh, I played in a thing one time where it was, you know, you, this guy had this big, massive kit with a cage and all kinds of stuff. And I had this thirties radio King set and I had to set up on the floor because this guy's set took up half the bar. <laughs> and, um, so we played and the sound guy come up to me and he's like, your drum set sounded great through the PA. He says, and wait till you hear this guy's kit. You know, <laughs> it, was like, it was, it was just horrible. And, uh, yeah. but yeah, someone said to me one time, they go, you know, if you can't take these kits out and play them, you, you'll wreck them. And I'm like, oh, you take them out and you play them. You just don't abuse them. You yeah. know, you, you don't roll them across the dance floor when you're loading out at night, you know, you yeah. put them in a case and put them in the truck. Yeah. And, uh, so and maybe stuff. don't do a, a heavy metal, a speed metal gig. Yeah. On a 40s yeah. kit. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. That's interesting. So, so, okay. Never mind. You do take them out and play them. But getting into <laughs> the, the, the 50s and the 60s, I mean, again, that's like to me, though, where people, you start to see the Japanese brands kind of come in and copy 60s, 70s, which I think does go back. I've got to remember back to the old Tama episodes where they did start to appear kind of in the late. 50s if i'm not mistaken um i gotta check on that but uh i feel like drums you got your gene krupa he was obviously already popular but drummers seem to be very much in the front of things 60s for sure but what kind of finishes did we see uh see then if if, if you know pick it up where you think it gets more the most interesting uh whenever 60s well uh, 50s and 60s you know 50s again like the wfl stuff you see a lot of white marine pearl has always been present i think since the beginning of the drum rap you know and uh but you see a lot of the glass finishes in the 50s versus the sparkles that kind of came up later can you explain that glass versus sparkle well it's ground up glass underneath a colored overlay and uh, sometimes when you find a kit you can run your hand across the top of it and it'll be kind of like like feeling an orange where it's kind of <laughs> sure. like bumpy uh, ground up glass underneath the colored overlay. Yeah. And, um, hmm. and I think that's, you, you see it where it almost pokes through the plastic. I think that's where you get your, like they call them liver spots, like the black mildew underneath the plastic inside the wrap. It creates a little opening for uh, moisture and yep. whatever, you know, is there a benefit to broken glass? Cause I always, I've seen those and, 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 uh, I mean, is there, is one better than the other in your opinion of broken glass finishes? And it also is one more like sought after, uh, the broken glass. I mean, uh, visually, I mean, a green sparkle drum set or a blue sparkle drum set. It's, it's, it's a lot of the glass kits are very pleasing to the eye. Hmm. and uh you know sparkle i'm a big sparkle guy yeah. and uh, you know the the glass glitters tends the materials tends to be a little heavier to work with but you know it's it it's really pretty you know it's that's the thing is it's it's really it has a certain kind of sparkle to it when light hits it yeah it's, just a, it's like a prism i mean yeah yeah exactly i have behind me a uh a, a japanese stencil kit i think it's apollo i got a Look, but um, it is a gold sparkle, very flat, very like uh, it's a sparkle, but it's 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 like uh, there's no real bounce off of it because yeah. it's just like a, I don't know, it's almost just little like tiny little like I, I don't know how they do it, but it doesn't have that like shimmer that even may, maybe again because it's a cheaper, you know, sure. Sure. stencil set but that it is very much like it's missing something where i guess like you're saying a glass broken glass which it's almost too like nowadays like every you know recycling it's kind of eco-friendly to have a broken glass kit 
because they're probably reusing a bunch of old broken glass. You know? I, you know, I remember the one year that broken glass finish became real expensive, even more than it is, you know, already. But someone was like, oh, there's a glass shortage. And I'm like, well, you know, there's empty pop bottles and empty beer bottles and empty liquor bottles and empty whatever. Everything was in glass, you know. Yeah. So, um, well, apparently there was a glass shortage at one point. Probably recycling, it was probably created the shortage of, you know, yeah, the process of doing it. I don't know. Well, it raises the question of when they're using broken glass, does it all need to be one color or clear? But I guess they're putting... So you said it's broken glass, and then they put a colored film over it. To That's give... the way I perceived it when I, okay. you know, I've, I've torn apart a lot of kits. You know, it's just like you get a kit that's too far gone beyond restoring. You end up peeling it and recovering it. And you, know, you get to see the guts of the drum set some somewhat. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, so that's broken glass. Obviously, we have normal glitter, which I guess, what's the, di- I mean, can you describe the difference that you've seen? Like, what would glitter just be a printed, like I was saying, a printed, you know, they would just put that design on a, a wrap and just go around? Well, a lot of the stuff that's, you know, it's, it's, um, if you look at it, like you get one right up close to your, you can see like little, they're like little discs almost with bends in them underneath a colored overlay. Mm. So basically, all your sparkles, most of your sparkles are silver sparkle with a different colored overlay. Sure. Then you, you, know, you see some, some really oddball finishes, but yeah. most, you know, most standard silver sparkle and champagne sparkles gotten to be real expensive because it's, it's real copper underneath a clear overlay. Yeah. So, you know, the price of copper has affected the drum world as well. Hmm. All right, so we got our sparkles, but we're also, so let's say we're in the 60s, late 50s, 60s. You also get some pretty far out. I mean, this is a experimental time. Uh, <laughs> and you get like... In more ways than one. In yeah. More ways, yeah, which which again trickles down. I think uh, some there there was some uh, drug-induced, uh, you know, finishes. Uh, there's a lot of like the, and it might be 70s, but, you know, in that era, like the tiger, the, the, the tiger swirl, like things like that, where yeah. I forget the exact name, but man, they're awesome. I mean, or they're the, so cool. I don't know exactly what your Kurt Ekstrom would be the guy to ask yeah. what your, you know, mod orange and stuff actually first hit the first year it was in a catalog. Yeah. But the mod orange, the citrus mod yep. and the psych red, um, you know, we're kind of like a, a more colorful version of black oyster and and blue oyster and the almost impossible to get pink oyster, you know? Mm-hmm. Okay. Expand on that a little bit where, I mean, you said they're impossible to get. They're out there. Oh, Is they're it- out there. Ask Danny Rivera. He has them all. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I mean, I guess in my mind too, when I hear this, it's like, I don't know if you're going to put up all this money, it's safer to buy a nice white marine pearl or, you know, a, a different oyster, something that's like, you know, timeless as opposed right. to buying something just far out, which now you'd be like, boy, I should have bought that rare finish. But those you just you in your experience, you don't come across a lot of them. Those those kind of more funky finishes. Uh, you, you know, the what got me into, you know, the first time I ever seen. A mod orange kid, a guy had one at his house. And I was like, what is that? I never, you know, I, a guy that was collecting drums long before me, I was like, what is that? And, uh, I tried to buy it from him and I, I couldn't get it from him. You know, it was, it was always one of those things where if you were interested in something he had, it, he didn't know what kind of price tag to put on it, you yeah. know? And, uh, so I tried to get the kit from him. Well, then years later, a citrus mod kit landed in my lap that, um, I didn't know what it was. I'd never seen one, didn't know what it was. I had seen mod orange, knew what it was, but it was different. And I asked a guy and he was freaking out. He's like, that's a citrus mod kit, you know? And, and I hear the picture of me playing it in some bar. <laughs> and, uh, he's like, you took that out in a bar and played it. <laughs> and, uh, but then that's of fun. course, you know, the more you learn about, um, you know, then the psych reds, you know, 
super vulnerable to the UV rays, you know, to fade out to, you know, they're interesting when they fade out, but they're just not as cool, you know, yeah. as, you know, mod orange is always faded. Um, Cycred citrus seems to hold up better than the other two hmm. for, for fading. I don't know, but yeah. If you just had to guess, just so people kind of know, this stuff is always interesting. What does like a mod orange or citrus or whatever, like what do these drum sets run for nowadays? Like if you come across one, are these like $5,000 or are they like 2000? I mean, what do people usually pay for these nowadays? Well, they were, they were 3000. I don't know how many years ago, eight, 10 years ago, Okay, you know, and it's, it's, you know, the market goes up and down a little bit, but you know, if you got a downbeat mod orange kit, it could be five thousand dollars six thousand dollars you got the you know these guys are gonna everybody keeps pushing the envelope on price on this stuff but yeah people seem to be paying it so you know i guess that's where the market's at these days yeah 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 i mean uh i guess something's worth what they'll pay for it until it hits a point where it has to kind of go the other way um sure You'll you'll probably know what I'm talking about. I forget the specific details. Wasn't there a Ludwig finish? Uh, I remember hearing it on an episode about Mitch Mitchell, where they were they they didn't like how the finish turned out, so they wrapped over it with something else, like a black finish, I believe. Well, people- you know, you know, like I was saying, but, you know, some of the the more wild finishes weren't very well received. So you'll find like citrus mod kits people probably took resale value or just, you know, jazz guys always want a black drum set. You know, they always seem to want a little black or silver sparkle drum set. So they're not going to buy a psychedelic drum set, (laughs) you know, and and a lot of people just kind of shied away from that. And, um, I think they had trouble selling the citrus mod kits and you start seeing them get wrapped over in black Panther. That's right. Every, Every once in a while, a drum turns up. That's, Jack Lawton had a great big orchestra drum, great big gigantic bass drum a few years back that had Black Panther over the Citrus Mod. And wow. uh, it was like a 40 inch bass drum. Jeez. You know, it was like a mile of Citrus Mod on this thing. <laughs> wow. I mean, talk about rare. I wonder if peeling it off works or if you get damage then from the glue on the Citrus Mod. I mean, well, the. Uh, a friend of mine had a floor tom that had, you know, Jack Lawton is the guy as far as getting the the Black Panther off of Citrus Mod. You know, I think it's very, it's just, it's like anything, patience pays off when you're doing something like that. You can get the glue off, buff the glue off of the thing. Yeah. I would imagine you'd have to put the badge back on. Yeah. Stuff like that. But, you know, it's doable. Yeah. I, um, a, one of those green sea green pearl radio king floor toms and i think it might be the one that cooper had was painted black at one time hmm. and it took jack a couple of years to get the paint off of it just Man, painstaking it, work yeah but it took someone five minutes just to to put paint all over it to wreck it yeah <laughs> to wreck it so I want to ask you a little bit about some Rogers finishes that come to mind too while we're talking about it. It would be the Mardi Gras and then the the Scotty finish. Those are really cool. Rogers has some neat ones. Do you oh, come that across that is really cool. I've I've never owned one personally, but the the, the Scottish plaid finish was yep. uh was like a painted finish like the other Duco drums. Hmm. And uh, but yeah, the Mardi Gras and all that is just they're beautiful kits. Um Rogers guys will probably like kick my ass when they see me at the show, but it's like, unfortunately, most of those kits are bread and butter kits, you know, yeah. the, the, the drawn brass lugs that fall apart. Yeah. And great kits, you know, but that those lugs were kind of the, uh, the, the Achilles heel of the, the Rogers drum set, in my opinion. Well, again, expect- this is my opinion. <laughs> yeah, Jeff and Poe are going to come and find you. And uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so those guys will be like, "Well, you can just buy the new ones now." Yeah, at twenty dollars a lug, sure. Yeah, you know? but they're really. I just think it's cool that companies do that because there's there's really in that era you look at the catalogs, which is so cool to like just see the drum page finish. Where in this era, you really did see a lot of unique and interesting ones, and like like the Scottish uh, plaid, it's like. How many of those could they have sold? I mean, really, yeah. that's 
but it's so cool. But again, it's it's the oh, I love looking at that. But I've got money in my hand. I'm gonna buy blue sparkle because it's yeah. like yeah. it's safe. Uh, which I, I would probably do that. I'm guilty of it, but you know, it's you see people. It, it's almost like nowadays. I think it kind of correlates to like people buying those unique boutique brands like SJC and all these other brands where they're really far out finishes uh, that are kind of custom kind of seems like that back in the day where it's like you're you're the guy on the street who has the Scottish plaid drum set. Uh, it it takes kind of guts to buy it and play it, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't think anybody pushed the envelope on finishes more than Slingerland did. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, I think there's probably more Slingerland finishes for that brand than any other single brand ha- ever had. Um, John yeah. Dorn's that guy. John Dorn and Matt Barba are the, the Slingerland finish guys. Um, the, the, you, you could spend the rest of your life looking for one of everything that's Slingerland wise. Yeah. And I mean, I think Slingerland was ripped off a lot in many ways with the Japanese stuff, but you really do see yeah. a lot of direct copies of Japanese kits uh, from Slingerland, like those yeah. tiger, uh, yeah. which are awesome. I know I, I, I Stewart, I think is a Japanese brand that has a lot of that. Do you see that? Yeah, there is a yellow tiger. Yeah. Um, but then you'll see, then there's that kind of copper colored streaky, some yeah. people call it tiger eye or something like that. You see a lot of that. Yeah. You'll see a lot of the same finishes on different brands. And the only thing that's different about them is the uh, whatever tag they have stuck on them. Sure. Usually and a lot of that Japanese stuff. The one that I was always kind of fond of is the, uh, the, I don't know if it was star or what it was, but had the, um, it looked, kind of looked like a psych red, like a lava something yeah, or whatever yeah, it was called. Yeah. yeah. I always thought it was a much more pronounced version of psych red. That was kind of, it was always be cool to have a full set of those. Yeah. You know? I you have s- one, one made in Japan kit, my collection, and that's Fantasia Pearl. Describe it a little bit. Um, kind of like a white Marine Pearl kit with some black, um, splotches and like swirls and stuff like that on it hmm. um there's a couple different versions of it that i've noticed over the years now that i've taken paid attention to it there's you'll see one that's a little different than another one there's about three different brands that i've seen that finish on so hmm. you know 10 to 1 they all came out of the same place anyway you know yeah back in those days. well i mean that raises the question too of like you know wherever this rap was coming from like were they all even Japanese to the American brands? Were, were they all sort of pulling from the same? Uh, I'm sure there was probably a difference in quality in the cheaper Japanese brands, but I don't know. I mean, they're really similar finishes. <laughs> yeah. What I've noticed in the Japanese, you know, the old 60s, I always call them stencil kits or yep. catalog kits. Yep. Um, there usually isn't a backing on them, uh. like what we know from rap. It usually doesn't have a backing, so it's usually a little thinner and gotcha. you know, less durable for one. Less material. Um, yeah. I don't know. The, the the Japanese sets are like, uh, it's almost like a, addicting to be like, well, I could afford this. Like, this is like, this is like 400 bucks. Why, why not? As opposed to that, you know, uh, it's, it's american brand or whatever american made counterpart which would be three thousand but there's something to be said about buying the real deal uh and just forking out the cash well i i asked a guitar guy years ago i about some delray tysco guitar or something like that that you used to see for 40 bucks if that you know years ago and i was like these things are these things really bringing this much money now and he goes yeah well it's the it's the poor man's you know, it's the poor man's vintage guitar. Yeah. Not that they're bad guitars. It's just that, you know, I know gear snobs that wouldn't even look at one. And I think the drum thing is the same way. It's like, you got a cool kit, cool finish. Um, the way new drum heads, you can make about anything sound good yeah. to a certain degree. And, uh, it's like you having some cool vintage kit that doesn't cost you $3,000. You know? and, well, and you just raised a good point with the guitar thing. It's like, it's like, yeah, oh, they wouldn't look at it until someone like, let's say like Jack White 
or someone yeah plays yeah. one or that what, amp that amp Jack White plays. You know, those used to be laying all over the place. Yeah. All of a sudden, you know, Jack White's using one, and lucky for me, they tripled in value. You know, or <laughs> whatever. Yeah, or Ludwig standards. You couldn't give them away years ago. Club dates and Ludwig standards and Trixons. Yep. Years ago, they were three hundred dollar drum sets all day long. Now they're fifteen hundred dollars, two thousand dollar drum sets. You know? Those have cool. The Ludwig standards have pretty neat finishes, which are, are kind of unique. Those seem like you could only get those finishes on the Ludwig standard. Yeah, right? they had their own set of they had their own set of finishes for the standards. They had all the uh, the Strata finishes, and then the Mist finishes. Yeah. Then they had the, they called it Astro, it was the Satin Flame, but theirs was a different pattern. But yeah, they, the standards were, they always seem to be good and loud when you play them. I don't know if it's that lightweight hardware that's on them, sure. but they, they always proved to be decent kits. They had the you know less desirable spurs on them and stuff like that, but I've never played one that was really played bad. Yeah. And like I've you said, a, put heads on them. Of them. Yeah, put good heads on them. You know, I've, I've bought hundreds of cheap Japanese drum sets, just buying and selling. I'd buy a drum set because it had a cool symbol with it or something. And the prices were reasonable. I, I'd get, buy something to get something out of the deal that I wanted and then sell off the rest of it. But more often than not, the uh, when I'd buy one, it would still have the original heads on it. Mm-hmm. you know like just the tar beat out of them yeah and uh it was like oh, these two things probably didn't sound good when on day one you know with yeah. these heads on them <laughs> and uh well it was probably first. some beginner kid who or drummer that's exactly who, yeah that's what it was yeah know? yeah cool well randy let's so all right so that's 60s 70s uh it's it's a psychedelic time it's pretty far out i feel like there's a lot of unique stuff those those as you said are valuable and have have gone way up in value but i feel like they're they're more, more appreciated today than they probably were maybe back then because you can look back and say you know oh that's a really cool finish it's kind of a a neat thing to collect but as we move forward into the 80s, 90s, 2000s, which 2000s and on, it kind of seems like everyone sort of knows, you know, you're you're more in the modern days. But with the 80s and 90s, what did you see? Uh, uh, Solid finishes. 80s, yeah. 80s, you couldn't sell a drum set unless it was black. Yeah. You no, know, that's why I think you see so many drum sets that were spray painted over the sparkle. You know, you couldn't get a kid to play a sparkle drum set. They uh, They wanted a black drum set which I will never play. I'll never own. And uh, <laughs> the closest thing to a black drum set as I have is a black galaxy kit. Yeah. Uh, but it's just like solid finish. You know, a lot of the metal bands had with the exception of a few guys that had wild finishes, but most of them were always like solid finish drum sets. Yeah. And, solid uh, black, solid white, white, red, solid yellow. Blue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which there's nothing wrong with it. And I feel like the hardware was a lot chunkier then and just would cover the drum more. And it was big power toms, which there's a uh, there's a big following of power toms now. I will say that. And I've had people talk to me about it and say, hey, you got to do a power tom episode, which I, I will at some point. But, um, you know, it is I guess it makes sense, though. You don't really see four to- like rack toms, three floor toms in like uh citrus mod it it seems like those those psychedelic finishes fit really well on a nice little four piece drum set unless you were ed cassidy from spirit where he had the gigantic psych red kit with the big <laughs> gong bass drums yeah. and I mean, know, it's cool mo- yeah the more is more kit yeah those though seem less in your experience what do you think they seem less valuable for an 80s or 90s solid finish black drum set seems to maybe get less uh of a return on the value oh the price. yeah 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 you have like black cortex white cortex any cortex kits unless it's an oddball finish you know every once in a while a yellow one will turn up and they're, they're pretty rare yeah um and butcher block has kind of come into its own the past few years it's just like i remember people would just laugh and walk away from those things years ago and and uh, I like Butcher Block. I think I've always thought it's awesome. Did, yeah. 
is that a, how does they how do they do that? Is that just a, a like typically a wrap or what is the makeup of butcher block? Well, it's uh, it's like it's like countertop laminate. If you you've seen countertops that look just like a butcher block drum set, so it's a thinner version of that, like a formica. And uh, one thing about a Cortex drum set, as long as it doesn't split from the being frozen or something, the stuff usually wore like iron. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the resale on them, it's just the value. You know, it's a lot less than a some wild finish. I mean, someone's going to play one and it's going to be really popular and they'll shoot up in price. I mean, the first kit I remember taking lessons on or, you know, first couple teachers was a butcher block with blue Evans heads. And I was always like, you know, as a, as a, as a nine-year-old, I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> but you could have just filled those drums with jello and they would have sounded <laughs> the same way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was pretty dead probably because he had a bunch of nine-year-olds playing on him and yeah, it's just like, yeah. make it sound better. So, all right. And then we get into the modern days and I think everyone kind of knows what's happening today, but what do you think about drum finishes, uh, as we get, you know, to 2000 you know through the 2000s the last couple decades what's what's your take on it now well it's at a certain point it seemed like everybody started pushing the envelope on finishes i can't remember if it was um somebody had one that looked like a uh, a picnic tablecloth uh like a pacific kit or something like yeah. that but it looked oh, like yeah. a pic a picnic tablecloth and i'm like where can you go from there? <laughs> um, but no, you see all these great, they've reissued. They, they're on their second reissue for pink oyster. They're on their second reissue for mod orange. Um, they did a psych red glass glitter. They did a citrus mod glass glitter. Um, they're, uh, I think things stagnated for a long time. Um, they had a lot of, you know, boring finishes know stain finishes and just you know like i say kind of like everything evolved into solid color drum sets and they you know it, it, it really took off they they everybody started doing all these crazy finishes and and different colors and different you know uh, exotic bird's eye and stuff like that you know like really nice veneer finishes and stuff too it's yeah you know the, so everybody's keeping up with the Joneses on on cool drum finishes now. Yeah. You know, I love the oyster finishes a lot. And I, I wish that like, it's almost like if, if companies do it now, it's almost like an homage to the way it used to be, as opposed to presenting like, here's an, here's our drums in an oyster finish. Like for now, like this is new. We're doing this now. Not, not like a, oh, here's a throwback edition. You know, like I wish, I wish that was more ex- like, uh, popular and readily available to have these, but but like as you said, I guess they the creation of that finish isn't quite what it used to be. Yeah, it's like somebody would probably kill me for saying this. The uh, you know like like the oyster finishes, the black one's probably the boring of a most boring of them all. You sure. know when you compare to blue oyster or pink oyster or something, you know it's like. But it's the most sought after because of what's his name. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, now Gary Astridge is going to come after you. You've got a lot of people to watch out for at these (laughs) these drum shows. No, No, it's a safe place. Ringo is responsible for, you know, probably most of the Black Oyster drum sets that, you know, Ludwig produced, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's so funny to look back at old videos of different bands, different bands that played them even. Ian Pace had a Black Oyster kit. and all these different guys that had black oyster kits back then. Yeah. The question has been raised on this show a few times of, well, if they had, you know, 24 hours a day shifts, making drum sets, black oyster pearl eight days a week, as the Beatles joke goes, uh, where are they all? Cause they're not like, you know, you'd think they'd be like, you know, you can't go into a drum store or a pawn shop without running into a black oyster pearl. Uh, it's like they're not quite as easy to find, even though they made a million of them. You know, I, I, uh, I, I, you're right. Uh, you'd think that as many as they, of course, I used to find blue oyster like crazy. Mm-hmm. I, I've sold I don't know how many blue oyster drums and how many blue oyster kits I own at the moment. Um, it's it's crazy. 
there's kind of a curse out there, in my opinion, kind of a more of a pet peeve is these guys, because they never seen it, it's rare. And yeah. it's like, oh, the rare blue oyster. And I'm like, God, that stuff I used to find. I couldn't give that stuff away at the drum show years ago. Yeah. And uh, it's always seemed like, you know, when I was out picking drum sets, I used to, you know, I was buying a drum set a week for a long time years ago, like 25 years ago. It was just like I was still buying drum sets all the time. And it was always like seemed like the disposable instrument for some reason. Yeah. Um, it was just, everybody had one and it just took up too much space for as much use as it saw. And they were just like, they'd almost beg you to take it. You know, I bought drum sets for ridiculously low prices just because people, you know, saw it as they could figure they could sell it, but it was also in their way, you know. It's yeah. Been keep taking up space for too long. Yeah. They're big. They're loud to the non drummer. They're annoying. Maybe yeah. your kid didn't want it. You're like, you said, grandpa had it in the attic. Uh, but you know, that's where you swoop in and save the day. And, uh, yeah, give- <laughs> yeah. I did them a favor by, by buying their drum set. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Randy, this has been really, really cool. I'm, I'm glad to, to talk to you and have you on the show. Um, because, you have always come very highly recommended. I know Vincent Ward has been on me about getting you on the show and you're just one of those guys from, from, I haven't been to a ton of shows, but you're a staple of the shows. I mean, you're just, you're kind of, you, you, you're always really there and you're very nice and, and, uh, happy to help people. And I think you're one of the guys too, who really supports the younger generation coming in, which is important to keep our instrument, you know, alive. Well, I try to keep it a hobby. So, uh, I'm not there trying to quit my day job. So I'm, you know, it's fun. It's a hobby that I've met some of my best friends doing and the drum show. Uh, I was at the very first drum show. Hmm. Um, there was a, a farmer that lived in the area around here had the very first drum show. Who was uh, that? Uh, the guy's name was Joe Hutchinson, or okay. I should say the very first, what evolved into being the Chicago drum show. Okay. I'm, I'm sure there was maybe some. Sure. little things before then but as far as the, the chicago drum show which was kind of set the bar for drum shows uh there was an f- old farmer who started building drums around here out of keller shells and stuff and uh joe hutchinson was his name and he had this little drum show basically it was going to showcase these kits he was building he was kind of doing some experimental stuff and and uh of course all the vintage guys show up and they, they couldn't care less about that stuff and they were all buying parts and pieces and hoops and rims and stuff like that and rob cook was there selling books and stuff and Hmm. and uh that's you know kind of where the show was born right there wow yeah i mean it, it you need a place to facilitate everyone being together and you know it's not great that he didn't sell his drums that he was making but it really created i mean people need we need a place to go um which uh, I, yeah, again, meeting you at the drum show, I'll, I'll, I'll always remember we were walking through and you handed me a Heineken when I was with, uh, Vincent and I was like, oh yeah, I needed this, need a beer. <laughs> Cause I don't think I knew you could walk around with a beer and I was like, this just got a whole lot better. <laughs> well, you know, it was funny. We did the show there a few years and, and, uh, and, uh, I was like, we had this guy that was helping us in our booth. I was like, we sent him out to get some beer. I'm like, I've been to the flea market here a hundred times because it's the show is only an hour away from me. I used to go to a flea market there that used to be second to none, you know. And and but I've sat around and drank beer with guys at the flea market. I was like, fairgrounds, they have beer at the fair. Yeah, so I never, I didn't, and, and nobody objected. So kind of, you know, put a few beers in somebody and loosen up their wallet, you know. <laughs> No, we just, I, 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 I try to keep it fun. Me and my buddies get together. We have a few beers, go to the drum show. You get together with your friends that are all into the same thing you're into. And you have a couple beers and have some yep. laughs. And some of yep. these people I only get to see, unfortunately, once a year. Absolutely. And, uh, that I've become heartfelt friends with, you know? Yeah. I look forward to them so much. I've, I've said it on the show before, but I don't think I'll be at the Chicago show this year. Cause there's. I'm having a, my wife's having a baby like two weeks before and it's just like, that's probably not going to work out, but, um, <laughs> it is, uh, it is so awesome and it's just such a good community, um, that, uh, you know, I'm sure I'll see you around at the next one or at one of the sure. other ones, but, um, 
So uh, Randy's going to be kind enough to join. He mentioned earlier, and I said we'd refer back to it, but uh, we're going to do the Patreon bonus episode this week on getting Randy's tips on wrapping drum shells uh, because it's not that easy. It's kind of intimidating. Uh, you just, I guess you have to do it. I've never done it myself. I've been very close to just buying all the stuff. And then I went, oh my God, like I said, it's $500. I can't afford that right now. But so Randy has told me that he has a kind of an unorthodox way of doing it, which I'm excited to hear about. Um, so if people want to hear that, go to drumhistorypodcast.com, Patreon button in the top corner and two bucks a month and up. And you get to hear these bonus episodes with uh, people like Randy and all kinds of things. So um, Randy, do you want to tell people like, where they can find you? Are you trying to actively sell drums online? Anything like that? Or is it just more of a find you at the show kind of deal? Uh, mostly find me at the show. Um, I'm not shy about handing out cards with my phone number on it. And um, I, I get calls all the time, people looking for specific items. Uh, I get ambitious once in a while and list some stuff on the marketplace and you know the, all the drum pages on there. Yep. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to not make it a 40 hour a week job. You know? Yeah. This stuff is hard when you have like regular jobs and other things going on, like most of us do. I mean, it's like, uh, but somehow we always find time for, for drums. Uh, and you're on Facebook, obviously that's where I've talked to you most. So I'm sure if people want to reach out and say, Hey, do you have this or whatever? Uh, I guess find Randy on there as well. Oh, uh, it's been a great, yeah. Uh, Facebook, you know, say what you will. Um, it's been a great tool for common interests with different people, you know, dog people, drum people, uh, unfortunately politics enters into it too much, but yeah, it is, you uh, get out of it, what you put, it is what you make of it. Like, yeah, find your same with podcasts, same with everything, any hobby. Um, but well, Randy, we made it happen after all this time and hopefully we'll have a Heineken again, uh, at some point soon. But, um, I just want to thank you for coming on and thanks to your wife, Nancy, for helping get it set up. Um, so this has been a real pleasure to have you here. Thanks for having me.